that phrase we have in the, the chants and goodwill. May I look after myself with ease. May all living beings look after themselves with ease. It's a wish that we can all depend on ourselves, that we have the resources within us. So when the going gets tough, it doesn't get tough for us. We have something we can fall back on that we can really depend on. We take refuge in the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha, but they're prim primarily examples. They learned how to depend on themselves, the Buddha and the Sangha, by depending on the Dharma. That's a very large concept. What kind of Dharma are they depending on? Well, look at what resources you have inside. In the Buddha's analysis, we shape our experience in three ways. Bodily, through the way we breathe. Verbally, through the way we talk to ourselves and what he calls direct a thought and evaluation. You direct your thoughts to a topic and you make comments on it, ask questions, come to judgments. This is a lot of what our, what our internal chatter is. And then finally there's mental, <clears throat> mental fabrication, which are perceptions and feelings. Feelings here are the feeling tones of pleasure and pain, neither pleasure nor pain. And perceptions are the images you have or the words you have to identify things. You see the light of a candle and you think, candle flame. You see the Buddha image and something inside you said the Buddha image. Those are perceptions. And these are the things by which we shape our lives. And these are the things that we can rely on if they're trained. As the Buddha said, the problem is we're usually doing these forms of fabrication in ignorance. That's why we suffer. But if we can bring knowledge to the process, then they become part of the path out away from suffering. That's what we're doing right now. We're bringing knowledge to all three processes as we focus on the breath. Try to breathe in a way that's soothing for the body right now if it needs to be soothed, energizing if it needs energy. Start with a couple good long deep in and out breaths and just notice how the breathing feels in the body. We're focusing not so much on the air coming in and out of the nose as in the feeling of movement and energy that goes with the breath. And that exists on many levels. There's even a still breath inside, a level of energy that doesn't move. You can access it in certain spots, in what John Lee calls the resting spots of the breath. But at the beginning it's best to focus on the in and out breath, because that gives you something to work with. As you ask yourself the way I breathe, what is it doing for my body right now? Could it be more refreshing? And how about the way the in and out breath relates to the flow of energy in the blood and in the nerves? Can you sense that? If you feel tension or tightness in any part of the body, think of it relaxing. If you notice that as you breathe in, you're holding on to tension in some spot and in order to breathe in, we'll drop that tension. You can still breathe in. It's just that different muscles will take up the take up the job. And when you find a rhythm of breathing that feels good, it can either be long or short, shallow, deep, fast, slow, heavy, light. Maintain that rhythm and then think of the ease or sense of comfort that comes from that spreading through the different parts of the body. All of that is called bodily fabrication. Now you notice if you've been the type of person who represses emotions or holds things in, you're going to have a lot of tension or tightness in different parts of the body. It takes a while to work through those. Sometimes even old wounds will get in the way of the breath, moving easily through the body. But if you're patient and take an interest in this, here it is, free energy to sustain your body. What can you do with it? 
if you bring awareness and attention to what you're doing, you begin to find that you can rely on yourself, at the very least on the bodily side. Now, while you're doing this, you're talking to yourself about the breath. That's what the verbal fabrication is. Technically, direct a thought and evaluation. Keep directing your thoughts to the breath. If they go off wandering someplace else, turn the arrow around and bring it right back to the breath. And then you can talk to yourself about the breath. Evaluate it. How is it? Is this good? Is it not good? So you've got the verbal fabrications right there as you're working with bodily fabrication. And then with the perceptions and feelings. You've got the feelings of ease that you're trying to create and trying to maintain. And the perceptions are the images you hold in mind. In this case, your perception of what's happening when the breath comes in, what's happening when the breath goes out. How does it move through the body? What needs to be done so that it, needs, that it can move more efficiently, more smoothly, more evenly, with more coordination? What images do you hold in mind as you ask these questions? Those are perceptions. And there are lots of different ways you can perceive the breath. As I'm saying right now, you could think of it as just the air coming in and through the nose, or you can perceive it as a flow of energy in the body. And the image you have of the body can be many different things. One is of a sponge. So we breathe in, you're not just pulling the air in through the nose, but you're breathing breath energy in through all the pores of your skin. You just hold that image in mind and see what it does to your breathing. Or as I said earlier, you can think of those spots in the body where it's kind of the resting spot of the breath. That when you breathe in, the energy actually emanates from different spots in the body as it spreads out through the body. So you don't have to think of pulling the breath in from outside, just think of opening things up so that as the energy spreads from those spots, say around, around the navel, just below the breastbone, in the middle of the chest, base of the throat, middle of the head. Think of the breath as originating there, and then allow it to spread through the body. If you notice there are any patterns of tension or tightness that get in the way, again, allow them, allow them to relax. Or you can think of the breath element as being both in and outside the body. It's not confined to the outlines of your physical body. So that the skin doesn't form a barrier at all. And then it's breath already both outside and inside. Think of them coming together, being coordinated. That's a perception you can use as well. So what you're doing is you're using these different processes, these different things that the Buddha calls fabrication, or sankara, with knowledge. Then you can create a sense of well-being right here. Both physical and mental, where everything comes together. The body is filled with breath, it's filled with a sense of ease, it's filled with your awareness. You can think of the sense of ease and well-being as kind of like the glue that holds your full awareness of the body, together with the body and the breath. And there you are, you've been fabricating something with knowledge. And as you get used to these different types of fabrication, the breath on the one hand, your directed thought and evaluation on another, your perceptions and feelings on another, you realize that you're shaping your mind, you're shaping your experience, not only here while you're sitting with your eyes closed, but as you go through the world. There's so much coming in through our senses that we tend to forget how much we're going out to shape things, how we interpret what's coming in, how we deal with it. Now we suppress some things and augment other things. But it's all these three processes. Something gets you angry, the breath's going to kick in right away and do something strange. If you don't watch out, it's, you have this feeling there's something inside you you've got to get out of your system. Well, it's basically because the breath has been irritating you. And part of the mind actually likes the irritation. It'll, it wants you to act on the anger. It'll stir things up in the body, so you do feel a sense of being oppressed, of being stifled. 
You have to ask yourself, do you really want to go along with that? Or do you want to bring some knowledge and awareness to this and breathe through the building sensations of, of tension in the body? So you can think more clearly about what's going on. Then you ask yourself, how am I talking to myself about this? If the Buddha were here listening out of my conversation, what would you think? And then finally with the perceptions. These are the real instigators. Because we're, when you're operating with perceptions, you're operating way back in the lizard brain. The, the little flashing images that go through your mind. And ask yourself, this perception I have of what the situation is, how many layers are there in the perception? As I peel them back, what can I find? that's aggravating the situation. Can I replace those perceptions with others? This is some of what we do when we practice goodwill. You're dealing with difficult people, and all you can think about is your suffering, how being, you're being mistreated. But if you can stop and think with that other person, why are they acting in this way? Is the issue really me, or is it, is it something in them? Can I get out of the way? Do I have to think that what they're doing is aimed at me? Can I step out of the way a bit? And in reacting to their mistreatment, what would really be goodwill for that person? That takes you out of your sense of being victimized, and you have a different way of perceiving the situation, a different way of talking to yourself about the situation. So maybe you can think of something that would resolve the conflict. This is just one example, but it gives you an idea. These processes are happening all the time, these forms of fabrication. If you want to learn how to rely on yourself, you have to look at them, because this is what you have to fall back on. This is one of the reasons why we have the Dharma to teach us, to give us different ways of thinking about things, different ways of perceiving things. All those images and analogies the Buddha uses in the canon, those are to give us new perceptions. Like when you're passing judgment on somebody, way back in the back of your mind there may be, may be the perception that you're way up on the judge's seat and that other person is a little tiny ant down on the floor, and you can step on them anytime you want. That might be there. I'll replace that one with an image the Buddha provides. You're going through a desert. You're hot, tired, trembling with thirst. And you come across water in a cow's footprint. It's a little tiny puddle of water. And you realize if you were to scoop it up with your hand, you'd muddy the water and you couldn't drink it. So what do you do? You get down very carefully and you slurp up just as much as you can of the clean water in there. They wouldn't want anybody taking a picture of you at that point. But you need that. You need the water. In the same way, you try to look for the goodness in the other person, so that you will be motivated to act in a skillful way, because you don't see any good at all in anybody else, and you get careless in your actions. So try to look and have a sense that you need that goodness to maintain your own goodwill and, through your own goodwill, be skillful in your actions. Or if someone has been really mean to you and you think you're sort of in the line of fire, can you perceive yourself as being outside of the line of fire, that when they say something nasty, it doesn't come right at you, it goes past you? They may be aiming those words at me, but I'm not the right target. Those, are, those words don't apply to me. But watch them as they go, and you realize okay, it's that person's karma. And the reason you are suffering from the words is because you were pulling them inside. Our minds are like vacuum cleaners. We go through the house and we pick up just the dirt all too often. So when a word is fired in your direction, step aside a little bit. Watch it go past. 
see if you can hold that perception in mind. And also hold in mind the, the Buddha's comments that the nature of human speech is there's going to be true speech and there's going to be false speech. There will be well-meaning and ill-meaning, kind or unkind. This is normal human speech. The fact that the unkind, untrue words are being directed to you, there's nothing out of the ordinary there. This helps pull you out of the situation so you don't feel so victimized by it. It doesn't mean that the words are any better than they were. But you don't have to suffer from them. This is what the nature of the Buddha's skill is all about. There are things in the world that we can't change, but there are other things we can't. But one of the things we can change is the amount that we're going to make ourselves suffer over the things that we can and cannot change. And what are our tools? These three kinds of fabrication, bodily, verbal, mental. If you learn how to do them with knowledge, they become part of your path. They become your refuge. Something difficult comes up, you breathe in a different way, you think in a different way, you apply different labels and perceptions. Train yourself beforehand to have a good stock of these things on hand. This is why we listen to Dharma talks, why we read the Dharma. So we can increase our stock of good tools. Then we work on the concentration to have a sense of well-being in all of this. In the Buddha's image, the practice of being like a fortress. You've got the soldiers of right effort. You've got the gatekeeper, and it's mindfulness. You've got the wall, which is your discernment. And you've got stocks of food, and that's your concentration. Because if you can give yourself a sense of well-being, simply by the way you breathe, settle your mind inside, you find you've got something you can tap into any time of the day, in any situation, because the breath is always there. The chatter in your mind is already there. Bring some knowledge to that, and it can become your refuge instead of dragging you down. So you've got the resources within you. The things you're doing already simply bring some knowledge to them. Be observant. Try to use a little ingenuity. Pick up on lessons from, from the Buddha, the great teachers. Then, using their example, figure out new ways of applying their teachings to your specific situations. That way you find that you really do have a refuge inside. You can look after yourself with ease.